Welcome to the High Bandwidth Word Podcast, transformative studies of the Word of God. I'm Pastor John Harris, and this is my podcast. Looking forward to this new season of studies. We're going to be opening the book of Hebrews and studying it chapter by chapter, verse by verse. This is an exciting book about the new covenant and the Lord Jesus Christ and all that He is. Grab your Bibles, grab your notebook, and let's get ready to go. Fight the good fight of faith. Hebrews chapter 6. <clears throat> So when we were uh, together last, two weeks ago, two weeks ago we uh, were looking at uh, this passage here in Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 8, and I just wanted to sort of, and we sort of did it right at the end of uh, our time together, so I just wanted to just refresh our memory, I just uh, uh, referred to a couple of verses that refer to these people. Um, At the end of this age, I mean, well, you know, again, the book of Hebrews is written to a group that you know, to, to, to a generation that has the opportunity to enter in the rest. Basically, again, you know, Paul's not in view. The, you know, Paul's epistles aren't, I, do, I don't believe, have been written yet. I don't, you know, he may or may not have been saved at this time. I don't know yet. But the issue is that Paul is not, you know, out sharing the truth of today, the grace, the, the, you know, the dispensation of the grace of God. Uh, because it doesn't, I, I don't believe the book of Hebrews refers to it at all. And it's just a book of the new covenant, all right? And, and a book that's explaining to them that the law, the old covenant, is done, all right? And, and the new covenant is in reach. And uh, so it's like, you know, this age hasn't happened. It's not there, okay? It's before it. And uh, they don't see it. And the concern is that they have an opportunity to go into rest, right? They, you know, they have an opportunity, and they don't want to miss it, Right? And so that's, that's the writer of Hebrews is doing that, talking about that. And so here in Hebrews 6, there is a concern that there, w- there will be people who will rise up amongst them that look like them, sound like them, but are really evil in the heart, all right? The Apostle Paul said after he was leaving, right, and one well, of the last times too, that there's, you know, we're going to enter perilous times, right? Well, these are, this, these are perilous times for the nation of Israel and for believers, uh, in this time. So Hebrews 6, certain, certain verse 4, it talks about this group. Okay, and again, the key, the key verse that we're dealing with here is, is verse 3, which goes back to verse 1, all right? Basically, in verse 1, he says, let us go on unto perfection. So we're going we're gonna to go on to maturity, all right? And, and the concern is from before is that they're not mature. They're not ready. They're not what they ought to be. And so they need to get some, you know, uh, what do they call those little short, like a short course in getting it together. Uh, because uh, if they don't, they're going to get duped. And verse 3 says, and this we will do. That's basically go on to perfection if God permit. So then he talks about this group of people. And so in here, it's sort of hard to tell who they are. But I'm going to read them to you again. Verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, who have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meat for them uh, by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, is not in the cursing, whose end is to be burned. So the you know the analogy is here's the earth, you know, the rain pours upon it, the sunshine comes upon it, and it there's two things that can be brought forth. You can bring forth something good, like herb and green things and valuable things, but then there's also parts of it that brings forth thorns and thistles and briars and and things that should be like are burned you know when a farmer cleans a like, but when you when you want to clear a field that's been there growing wild for a while there's all kinds of stuff there you don't want so what they used to do they still do it they burn it right they would do a controlled burn and they'd burn off the grasses and the briars and things it's easier than going through and trying to cut those things out or whatever and that's the, you know, the idea here. So these, these individuals bear thorns and briars and is rejected and is, nigh, and by, is near, nigh unto cursing. They're not cursed, but they're nigh unto because they still have a chance, but odds are they're going to be cursed. Anyways, but they've tasted of it and they've seen some things. So we, we looked at a couple, we, we looked at a passage in Second Peter. Go to Jude. Okay, well, now we go, before you go to Jude, let's go to Matthew. So the Lord Jesus Christ talked about these folks. Right, 
And again, we are, we're at a time period where we're getting ready to enter the tribulation, right? The tribulation period, this, this time that, they, that the Israel has to go through before they get to rest, all right? As they, they, the, the new covenant comes in operation and they are in the place that they ought to be. As Paul says, you know, that uh, he says, and so all Israel shall be saved, Romans chapter 11, but not before uh, the, the, deliverer, the, the deliverer roars out of Zion. Okay, so it's after the second coming. Chapter 24, verse 3, the apostles are talking to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they say to him, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, his disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And the end of, I mean, the, is the end of this age, the end of this time that we're in. What's it going to look like? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Look, look, he says, he says you've got to be careful. Very first words. You want to go into perfection? First words. Take heed that no man, what? Deceive you, right? Those individuals, and the writer of Hebrews is talking about the same, but those, take heed that those individuals don't deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am what? Christ, and shall deceive many, right? They're going to see, so, so there's going to be those that come uh, uh, against you, come here, and they're going to say that they're Christ, they're Messiah, they're, they're deliverers. They're going to talk about themselves like they're gods, right, in some fashion, or they're Messiahs. Um, verse 8 says, And these are all the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise. And what happens? And just leave many. Because iniquity shall abound, because sin is everywhere, it's just rampant. The love of many shall wax cold. As it's going to, you know, their, their love is going to become not warm and affectionate. It's just going to be cold. It's going to be dulled. It's, they're just not going to love like, like they need to. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be what? Saved. <laughs> what type of salvation is that? It's, it could be physical salvation. Um, it's not necessarily talking about soul salvation. Um, but it could be talking about soul salvation. Uh, when you endure to the end, that doesn't mean you live. It means you endure, and you endure to the end of your life, right? In, uh, I'll just, the, to me, the proof verse is Revelation 12. Go to Revelation 12. There's a couple passages that talk about enduring. But enduring to the end is not necessarily living th through the tribulation to the end, then you get the other side. Now, if you live the whole way through the tribulation, get the other side, you, you are saved physically as well as spiritually, right? But not everybody is saved physically. Revelation 12, verse 11. Well, I'll start in verse 10. And I heard, by the way, remember this war in heaven? The devil and his angels fight with Michael and his angels, and the devil and his angels are cast out. They're cast out to the earth. And when they come to the earth, this is the middle of the tribulation, things go, they go real bad, all right? And verse 10 says, And I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of, of, of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. You know what? The heavens are like, yeehaw! Okay, it's, it's, it's good now. They're, they're, they're out of here, right? They've been there afflicting the, the heavens for a while. But now the devil and his angels are gone, so the heavens are rejoicing. But that's not the case on the earth. And they overcame him, talking about the, the deceiver was cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. So they need Christ, right? By the word of their testimony, they, they, they stand there and they keep their faith, is what they're basically, that's how Peter talks about it. And they love not their lives unto what? The death. You know, so that is their, it wasn't about this life and keeping myself. They, they, they trusted God. They died, right? They died with testimony. Verse 12 says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devils come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Right, and that goes on to say that the, dev the dragon, the devil, he's persecuting Israel. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, by the way, this was sort of a whirlwind thing that happened, right? It wasn't like he, it was like all of a sudden he like opens his eyes and where's he at? Okay, and he's locked out going back up. Their place is found no more, right? He persecuted the woman. If you compare it back a little earlier, the woman is referring to Israel because she brings forth the, well, it talks right there, which brought forth the man child. And that's talking about Christ, right? And then to the woman, Israel, were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, as three and a half years from the face of the serpent. 
So Israel, watching Israel, believing Israel, Israel who knows what's going on, because in the, in the tribulation you have multiple types of people. You have people who understand what's happening. All right, they have their eyes open, and when they see, uh, you know, Jerusalem surrounded by the armies of Antichrist, they're going to flee to the mountains. All right. And so they flee, and then the devil goes after them. Okay, Antichrist goes after them, just like Pharaoh, you know, sort of in that way, right? Goes after them, but then God protects them in the wilderness for three and a half years. But then there's a bunch that aren't paying attention. They're not watching and waiting, right? Uh, they, you know, they're, they're not prepared, right? And so then they end up being in, uh, they're, they're the ones hiding. They're the ones being captured. Those are the ones that are, you know, have to overcome by the blood of the Lamb you know, in the word of their testimony. Those who fled in the wilderness are going to live through the tribulation. They're protected by God. Those who weren't paying attention, who all of a sudden wake up and have to make a decision between taking the mark of the beast or, 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 or keeping their faith or, or believing God, I guess I should say it that way, uh, they, they will, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be in lots of situations where they're going to be in prison, they'll be tortured, uh, lots of awful stuff, all right? And they will, many of them will die for their testimony. Okay, go to Jude, Jude. Oh, no, go to 1 John, 1 John 2, sorry. It's all really close together, so you'll, you'll be fine. 1 John chapter 2. Okay. So these individuals are, are individuals that are, they're, they're, they are um, false prophets. They are antichrists. Because there is the antichrist, but then there are a lot of individuals that are uh, antichrist. I mean, they, they, they are, uh, talk about themselves in a way they try to take the place of. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, or 18 says this, Little children, it is the last time. You know, here's John. You know, how can he say it's the last time? How, how can he Because it's been like 2,000 years since he said those words. Because that's all they knew, right? They didn't, you know, Paul hadn't come along yet, or Paul had not been out. You know, the, the dispensation of the grace of God has not begun, or if it has, they don't know anything about it, okay? But anyways... Uh, Paul hasn't written any letters or anything I got to this point. Uh, anyways, it is the last time. And, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are what? Many, many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the, the last time. Okay? Notice this. They went out from us, but they were what? Not of us. See, they were amongst us, and then you know, they were hanging out with us. They were acting like us. They were living like us. You know, if, you know, if you if you, um, if you go back to early Acts, the uh, give me some. Do you, uh, do you know some characteristics of the early church? You know what? You know, how, you know. Uh, early, early, early kingdom church. Early Acts. So the body of Christ a little later. Okay, they were. There many were filled with the Spirit, right? So you have you know, and the, but you know some that weren't like Ananias and Sapphira, right? Okay. What about like their daily life? They shared everything. They, they sold all that they had. They had all things common. Thousands of them. They, they were, they were uh, ministered to. I mean, the apostles basically had to say, you know, some folks were being neglected. So they appointed some other men like Stephen and others, deacons, the first deacons, to help take care of the masses. Why did they sell everything they had? Yeah, yeah God was going to provide. They were going to go through tribulation. The time was short. Okay? It was only you know, from, the, from, from the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost to the stoning of Stephen's a year. It's a year. And then Christ was standing. Okay? That wasn't meaning, I mean, again, people want to make that he's receiving Stephen. And, but what he's doing is getting ready because God said, sit until I make your, enemies, make your enemies your footstool. He was going to come back. That's the beginning of you know, tribulation. It should have been three and a half more years, and then they would flee to the wilderness, and God would take care of them. So they just needed enough for... Three and a half years, okay, four years, right? What happened was that that didn't happen, right, right? That didn't happen. And then you find Paul, 15 years later, taking up offerings amongst all the Gentiles and all around the world for the poor saints in Jerusalem, okay? Those poor believing saints. Why were they poor? <laughs> they sold all that they had, right? Okay. okay. Yeah, well, you feel like, well, I'm sure, I'm sure they were concerned. But, you know, the apostles didn't leave them there, right? I mean, they didn't, like, say, hey, Sorry, people. They hung. They stayed in Jerusalem. Okay, they didn't go anywhere. Uh, I'm sure it was a concern. And by the way, if you read Second Peter, that's the, you know Second Peter is a response to their question. He's like, "Where's the Lord? Why hasn't He come back?" 
All right? I mean, it, it's a response. So what should they do in that case? And by the way, they, they began having great persecution anyways. And so the believers, of that early kingdom saints, they fled. They fled Jerusalem, but the apostles stayed. They stayed in Jerusalem. Yeah, I'm sure there's lots of questions, just like we have questions too sometimes. Why do things happen, right? What, what's happening? Well, you know, God changed what he was doing. Did God have the right to do that? The book of Romans, chapters 9 through 11, is basically Apostle Paul demonstrating God can do what he wants. He doesn't necessarily do it the way we think is the best way, right? He does it his way, you know. I mean, you take two children, you know, Jacob and Esau, who's the eldest, okay? How would man, the, the blessing? It should, should be Esau, right? All right, and, and, but, you know, God chose something different. You know, it's just God, God can choose, and God chose to do something different. Instead of bringing wrath... Okay, bringing, you know, what, what he planned to do, what, well, what, what was, you know, he said, he's, instead, he paused it. He's still going to bring it, but instead he brought grace. On the vessels of mercy, Paul says in Romans chapter 9, even us, that's the body of Christ. So God did something different today. But anyways, in those days, all right, okay, verse 19, go back to First John again too. They, they, you know, they went out from us, not us, but from them, okay, that early kingdom church, you know, 3,000 saved in a day, 5,000 saved in a day, all together, they're all amongst them, but these are individuals that wasn't like Ananias and Sapphira that were figured out, they were still there, but then they began to rise up, began to say things that they ought not say, and they came out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, they would have stayed with us, right? But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. All right, so they, you know, and then he goes to verse 20. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and, and you know all things. That is, you who are believers, you have the Holy Spirit, and, he, and, he, and, 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 and uh, it helps you discern those things. They did not, all right? They did not. So Jude's going to tell us that for sure. Okay. Um, anyways, uh, go back. Well, let's go to Jude. Jude. Jude, just Jude. So Christ talks about them as antichrist, false prophets. Jude, uh, John talks about them as antichrist. They were part of them. Uh, they, they were, but they weren't them, right? Or they would not have left them because what did God tell them to do? He told them to stay. He told them to be there. But instead they rose up. Start verse Jude 3. Jude 3. Beloved, when I get, when I, when I, by the way, the whole, the whole book of Jude is about these people, all right? It's, it's, it's what it's about, all right? It's, it's, it's the, you know, explaining, talking about these individuals who, like, if you think about it, like, if you think about, you know, suppose ABC is here, right? And, and we're, you know, we have a, you know, a couple hundred people here, and all of a sudden, like, 30 people just rise up and leave, or they start teaching bad doctrines, and the church has to deal with it. It would cause havoc and confusion, right? If, you know, you know I mean, even Paul talked about Philetus, Hymenaeus and Philetus, right, who... They're in Ephesus. They rose up and people followed after them and they destroyed the faith. It caused problems, right? It would hurt, right? And so, you know, the book of Jude <coughs> is talking about, hey, here they are. And it explains what they're like and who they are. And so, you know, you want to discern them, here, here, here you got them. Jude 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, that's talking about their, they're going to, as a it's sort of a national salvation, that's their common salvation. It's not their sole salvation, it's their salvation as a nation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So you need to fight for the truth. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who are before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in the times of Paul, there were people like this too, all right? And there still are today in grace circles. Uh, basically, uh, shall we not continue in sin that grace may abound? You know, Romans 6, you know, grace abounds, right? It gets, you get more grace the more you sin, right? I watched, I mean, I, I remember as a kid, there was a guy on television, you sit there, you smoke a cigar, I, I cross him on the station sometimes, and he'd be sitting there swearing, talking about grace. And it was, uh, I don't know, he wasn't on before ABC, so I'm not sure when he was there, but I remember seeing him a couple of times. Like, just like I saw P Jimmy Swaggart a few times, you know, something like that, so. But uh, and anyways, but he was basically preaching this concept that, gr you, know, great, you know, God's grace is sufficient. Sounds good, 
But what he's preaching is, is, is lasciviousness. He's, he's teaching ungodliness. Uh, anyways, keep reading. And, 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 and then, and I don't know if he did this, but and denying the only Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's, you know, he's, he's either not the way or he's not God or whatever. I will therefore put you in remembrance. So I, I want you to remind you, basically, that God does judge. Right? That's what he's going to say here. He says, uh, individuals who walk, who... who who come out from amongst, these are basically people that are like two types of people. They, they were with us and then they separated from us. All right, now take a look at this. So, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them, what? Believe not, right? So, they, you know, he, de- he delivered them out. Okay, so they were all together, but they weren't all gods. I mean, two million, I mean, think about it, two million or so individuals left the land a lot of, there were actually Egyptians that went with them, uh, went with them because, you know, to escape, you know, the judgment that God was doing there in Egypt. Uh, anyways, it was, it was a bunch of them. And then you have another group, and the angels, which kept not their first estate. So all the angels were God, right? But some of them chose, the, you know, and so you have good angels and bad angels. But then some of these angels even did something worse than that. They left that. You know, they were where they were supposed to be, good and bad. But then they, they chose to do something different. So these are angels who left heaven, came to earth, cohabitated with women. Okay, this is Genesis 6. And the angels who kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. They've already been judged, right? They're already in hell in some fashion. I think in the bottomless pit. I think you see them come out in Revelation 9 or 6 there. Anyways, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So, these, so what, what he's doing, these, these individuals that left them, that were like them, but they, but they turned the grace of God and lasciviousness and denied God and denied the Lord Jesus Christ, their judgment's going to be like this. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? What happened to the, the angels that sinned? What, you know, uh, you know, God's going to destroy them. Verse 8, likewise, also these filthy dreamers. So now we're back talking about these individuals that are amongst them. They're filthy dreamers. I mean, they dream up filthy things, right? Defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities, all right? So, that, you know, they're, they're, they're really free about how, what they say about other people. And then what Paul, or not Paul, Jude says, Yet Michael, God says this, yet Michael, the archangel, I mean, he's like, you know, he's a pretty good guy, right? Okay, top angel, right? When contending with the devil, he disputed, uh, he, uh, the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not break against him a railing accusation, but said the Lord rebuked thee. He didn't say to him, you stinky, lousy, blah, 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 and just sort of slammed the devil because the devil had authority, right, back in that day. Okay, back in the time of Moses, I mean, he was the prince of the power of the air. He's the spirit that works the children in disobedience. That's, that's who he is. He, he's the God of this world, right? It's little g, God of this world. And so Michael, because he had the authority, he was above him at that point. Now at the cross, Christ was given what? A name which is above every name. So who's the authority now? Jesus Christ. Now the devil's still floating around in those places. He's going to be cast to the earth one day. Right when that war happens, and Michael's going to go do that. He's going to have the authority because he's given the authority by the one above, right? And even in this point, God, you know, Michael recognizes the true authority. He says, the Lord rebuke thee, right? He didn't bring up us more as a railing accusation. Verse 10, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. So we're going back to these terrible people. So the writer of Jude is saying, here's this group of people that were amongst us. You know, John talks about them. Christ talks about them. You know, how, how, here's great details. How can you identify them? Because you're sitting in pews with them, not in grace, but in that kingdom church there, in the synagogue or wherever they might be. You're sitting there right beside them. How can you tell who they are? Well, like, for instance, like, you know, if you have a person beside you gossiping, how can you tell it's a gossip? Because they're gossiping. They're sing- you're supposed to do something with a gossip, not listen to them, right? Actually, you're supposed to rebuke them in love in some fashion. Verse 10, but these speak evil of those things which they know not, uh, but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. So they get themselves engaged in sinful, and they 
are proud about it. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. You know, um, anybody know what the way, the, the way of Cain? Uh, basically, it's the idea of works for religion, right? Sort of works for religion. Um, man's works uh, um, for religious benefit, right? And ran greedily after the heir of Balaam. Remember, Balaam believed that he could curse God's people. Uh, but because he looked at them and he saw they weren't perfect, right? But what he failed to understand is, is basically the long, larger concept about righteousness by God. So these individuals look at those around them and uh, I can get a following after me, okay? And that's actually the, the gainsaying of Kor. Uh, Korah is what it would be back in the Old Testament, uh, where um, he, he, um, they were, they were um, questioning Moses' authority, right? Moses' authority. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, anyways, um, they, w- they wanted to make themselves the authority, right? In, these individuals, are, well, you know, they, they question the authority of, say, that church, that kingdom church, you know, and they raise themselves up and say, I'm the authority. Antichrist, false prophets, they're, they're rising up, right? Verse 12, these are spots in your feasts of charity. So when you guys have dinner together and you have your, your worship services together, they're like spots, like leprous, cancerous spots when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Now, but notice what, what the writer Jude says they're like. Clouds they are with what? Water, right? Carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. The product of what they are is really nothing. They have, you know, they're a cloud, but they have no rain. They're a fruit tree, but their fruit's dead. In fact, they're withered, right? Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Have you ever been at the ocean? Okay. You ever see that when the wave sort of collapses, and you have all that foam, maybe it's even a foot deep coming in, all right? How much power does it have? The foam. You know, the, fame, if the, the wave has the power, but the, wave, the, the foam has nothing. So they have no real power. They're wandering stars. Uh, at that time, wandering stars were planets. They sort of go through. So when you look up in, the, you know, Few, 2,000 years ago to see a planet. It's just sort of like the stars are fixed and solid like rocks, and then you got this, thing before, or, or uh, asteroids or comets or another thing. Uh, it could be a wandering star. They pass through, but they just go aimlessly uh, through space. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. All right, so they, they, are, they, are, they have new, there's sort of no hope here. Okay, and then Enoch basically prophesies of these. Behold, the Lord come with 10,000 of saints, verse 15, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Right? Anyways, talking about the second coming. These are, and by the way, and those are angels, a- angels coming with uh, the Lord. These, these individuals, they are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. That is, that they, they, when, when they speak, they're trying to gather a crowd, you know, listen to me. It's not, you know, don't listen to the pastor or the, the whoever, Peter or whoever might be, listen to me. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of, uh, of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, should walk after their own ungodly lust. Matthew 24, which I read to you, right? These be they who separate themselves, they're sensual, that's of, you know, of, the, of, the, of the physical world, having what? Not the spirit. So they're totally natural. They're not, they're not believers. They look like it, okay? If you, if you did a test, you know, you did a little litmus test, they pass like everything, except they don't have the spirit. That is, you know, you, you, would, you would be convinced. Praise God, we're not going to be there for that, right? For this, right? However, we do have these folks we need to be concerned about in the church, right? Go to 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy. Today, in this age, at the end of this age, the last times of this age, and I would say that most of us would feel, well, I know this, that we are closer to the rapture than we were yesterday, right? It, the days are getting closer to that time, um, you know, the Lord could tarry, or I don't, I don't know if it's tarrying as much as he just has a plan. The Lord has a plan maybe a lot further out in the future, but it sure feels like it could come soon, right? Uh, the Apostle Paul thought it was going to happen in his day. We're given those signs for it. 
but in the last days, these things also happen. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, and this know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Well, why will it be perilous? Well, because there will be terrible people, right? Uh, verse 2 says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Okay? Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, disobedient to parents, unthankful. They're not going to be loving, right? You know, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love. They're not going to manifest that. It's all about themselves. They're unthankful. You know, they're disobedient to their parents, okay? Uh, they're blasphemers. They're proud. They're boasters. Look at me. They're, covet they're, they're, they're covetous. They want and they take. And they are lovers of their own selves, far more than lovers of anybody else, right? That's their, that's, that, that's so like, they, they don't have love. They, they, uh, their walk is sinful. They're unholy. They're without natural affection. They, they don't care about anybody. They're truce breakers. You, know, you make a promise to somebody or a, you, know, you, know, you shake hands. You know, does, does a handshake mean what it used to mean like 50 years ago? Gentlemen, would you make a deal on a handshake today? Okay. okay. It'd be, I, I mean, I remember my dad, I mean, I, I remember I walked into a bank one time and it was Hollidaysburg Trust. Okay, and he talked to a guy behind the counter and he said, like, I'm going to get a loan for a car or something like that. They shook hands and he didn't even sign any paper. They, you know, maybe there was a paper sign, but they shook hands. Money was given and walked out and, you know, had a loan or whatever. I don't know. It was, it was, it was things, there were days when you could just shake hands. Not today, right? Okay. Especially not in this future day. They're um, false accusers, incontinent, you know, ba basically out of control frothing at the mouth when they get angry, right? Um, fierce, okay, their, their character is, is mean. Despisers of those that are good, you know. By the way, we, we have a tendency to do that. When something good happens to somebody else and it happened to me, you, you sit there and go like, eh. All right, well, this will be a characteristic uh, that'll be heavy at the time. Traitors, right? So it's, a, it's their nature, right, how they, how they walk, okay? It's a... Uh, um, it's the opposite of hope. It's not putting your focus on God. It's putting your focus on me, right, in, in that thing. And then, and then it's instead of having faith, which is like how we view things, it's just how they think. This is their mindset. They're heady. They're, you know, basically, they're, they're maybe intellectual, okay? It could be thought of it that way. High-minded, you know, sort of proud. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, all right? Having a form of godliness. So they... They can look okay from the outside, right? And people think of it, you know, I mean, um, uh, that they're maybe godly, but they deny the power thereof. They don't have the real, you know, fruit within them. And then, but God says, is from such what? Turn away. Because what they do is they lead away. It says silly women, but it's really talking about men as well. Talking about men who are, don't have conviction and stability, right? Individuals that don't have men. So for, for of this sort are they which creep into houses. So go door to door, right? And lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lust. So just pull, draw a flock amongst them. They're ever learning, okay? But, and never able to come to the knowledge of what? The truth. They never really come to know Christ. The truth, to me, I think, the truth is Christ, right? It's not coming to know the right division, okay? It's not that. It's about a living truth, all right? They never come to know him. And then he gives an example, all right? Now as John, Johannes and John Braves withstood Moses, so do these also resist truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. They're not, they're, 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 their, their relationship with the faith is, they are totally apart from it now. So they, if, in, I know, I believe it's happening in the church. It doesn't necessarily that all people are believers are doing this. But there are believers that do this as well. And Paul tells us about that in Philippians chapter 3. So go there. And just so you know, it can happen. So I think it's in the church. People show up. They look like believers sometimes. And then they act this way. They come in amongst us. I mean, I know that it was um, Steve. I mean, we were Steve Hammond this last weekend or last week-ish about, you know, they were with him. And they were talking about that they went to a church down in Florida. Okay. Pastor didn't know who he was. It's actually Fred Beckemar. You guys know Fred Beckemar? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, good guy. So they go there. They don't know who Steve is. Okay, but this is dangerous, all right? So he gets there, and there's a small group, maybe like 25 or 30 people there. And so Fred Beckemar asked Steve to take the offering up. 
be part of taking the offering. So if you've never been there before, shows up, would you like, you know, could you take the offering? Then he has Steve pray, okay? And it's like, I mean, when you allow people to get that fast, I mean, Linda is here, Linda uh, Gower, her brother Jim, we, we had, I had lunch with brother Jim Kemp over in uh, Indianapolis earlier in the week, or last week, whenever it was. And Jim was saying that um, uh, he, went out, he started attending the church he was at, one of these places he was at. They, were, it was a, they couldn't find a grace church, sort of like a Baptist church. He's there two weeks, and they asked him if he wanted to teach Sunday school. You know, you don't, you know, how do you know a person in two weeks, right? Okay. And, and so, because Jim, by the way, Jim's a Christian, right? Okay, okay. Steve's a Christian, right? But people can prepare, appear to be that. And then you put them into a place, and then they can bring, draw people away. So, anyways, Philippians 3, and probably need to, well, we've got a minute or two. Down in verse 17. So, after a, uh, a, an admonishment, a positive admonishment, verse, sorry, verse 15, let us therefore as many as be perfect, okay, be mature, be thus minded, and if at anything be, be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. So we need to be, in a, you know, we need to be one-minded, right? Brethren, be fall, verse 17, be followers together of me, mark them which ye walk so, which, mark them which walk so as ye have us, for an example, so you're supposed to look out amongst and identify individuals that, you know, we're looking at not for nominating people for positions, right? That's part of it. You know, you know people are examples of the believers to do that. Why should we mark individuals in a positive way and follow as an example? Well, verse 18, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are what? The enemies of the cross of Christ. So these are believers and now they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. And then he gives you sort of the, the, the prescription for how it happened. And, you, and it's backwards. You see the end from the, you know, so the end and then moves to how it started. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So it starts off with the, the, the earthly, you know, life becomes... Uh, that focus, right? God says in Colossians 3, if you don't be risen to Christ, seek those things that are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. They have put the affections of the things of earth first. And so that begins to become the dominant way they view world, the, life and how they live life. And then what happens is they start to glory in their shame, right? What's that mean? Well, they begin to be proud of, begin to, you know, the, the things that are shameful, Look, look what I allow into my life, right? I, I allow this into my life, I listen all into my life, and they begin to try and encourage others to participate in that same sort of, sort of thing, right? Okay? For instance, I'm going to get a speedboat next week, okay? and you know, I'm going to go buy a boat, and I'm going to go down to the river every Sunday. Okay? Go down to the lake, right? Okay? Every Sunday. And so I'm really enjoying that. Sharon, why don't you join me next Sunday, right? Okay, and you can bring another friend, and you come enjoy, enjoy this life with us, and you come with Penny and I, and we'll go down to the lake every Sunday, right? Okay, so I, so what I, I start glorying in my shame, because what I've done is I've separated from believers, I'm not living the life maybe I think I'm called to do. Right? Not that it was, boat was an awful thing, but my mind began to be dwelling on it, and then I start pulling somebody else in with me. I start telling you how wonderful it is. I'm doing this, not that... Having a boat's a bad thing, but if it controls your life, if it takes over your life, and then this becomes, I've been glory and shame, and then God becomes my belly. Whatever I want is what is God. That becomes my belly, and then the end of that is really destruction. Things just collapse, right? Okay. Um, there are people that it happens to. The world, it's, it's really, you know, they, when you start minding earthly things, the devil, who is the God of this world, right, the prince of power of the air, he begins to pull it in. And what happens, your flesh will convince yourself that it's not, that it's good, right? And, uh, and things like that. And it could be very simple, buying a boat. So, so you know, and, and I just did a, hopefully, I'm, I was trying to think about something. I know people have boats, but it's not a bad thing. Just don't, don't yell at me. But it could be, you know, you're here, so I know it's not your problem. Right? So there you go. So. All right. Yeah, the weather's bad, too. That's right. It's really crappy today. So, anyway, Anyways, so even in this age, there are individuals, okay? And, so, and Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 11. We'll finish with this. Because I, I see Sharon, or Marsha looking at me. Okay. I can feel her eyes burning into me. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. 2 Corinthians 11, 
verse 13. Okay, and we could, should start a little further up. Uh, but anyways, uh, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into what? Apostles of Christ. I mean, they look like they're spokesmen for God, right? For Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself has transformed an angel of light. He is the motivator. He's, the, he's the, the, the driving force. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. They come up and they begin looking. You know, they, they, they look like they're talking about good things. Like, you know, legalism is an example of a minister of righteousness, right? You do this, this, and this, and God will be happy with you. There's a fine line between grace, which says... God is happy with you, so do this, this, and this. There's a little difference, right? Legalism says do this, this, and this, and then you live up to a standard, and then God's pleased. God's already pleased with you, okay? He's already saved you. He's already given you everything. Now, because of his love, do this, this, and this, because that makes God happy. Living by faith makes God happy, right? We, you know, that, that's what pleases God, and not doing a system of works to try to make yourself better. We, we choose to do it because God loves us and we love him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your, just the gift of your grace and your son, Jesus Christ, and for the, uh, the goodness uh, of, of him in our lives. And help us, Lord, just to be who you want us to be. Father God, we thank you for this church, for its ministries, and continue to pray, Lord, as we move forward uh, to guard and protect and just uh, continue to abound this ministry. Let us be a light, Lord, that shines into this region, this community, this world in a way, Lord, that uh, redounds under your honor and your glory. And we praise you, Lord, for what you're going to do today. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. You've been listening to the High Bandwidth Word Podcast, Transformative Studies in the Word of God. I hope you've enjoyed the study. Please subscribe, like, and comment. This podcast is available on many podcast platforms. Just search on the title. Now, until next time, fight the good fight of faith and God's best to you.